Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland, and today I've got Dr. Adam Price with me. Uh, Adam, how you doing? Good. Good this morning. Thanks for having me on, Brett. Absolutely. It's good to be with you. I, I told you before we started recording, I, was, uh, I always try to read one parenting book a year. I need to do more than that, I know. Uh, as a father of four boys, I need to read a lot more uh, books on parenting, I'm sure. But uh, Googled something the other day and, and your book came up and I started listening to it and, and it's been phenomenal. So I'm uh, glad we're now here together. So it's amazing how the world works. Well, and I'm glad that I made your list for the one book of the year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Well, uh, before we dive into uh, your book and, and all the other great stuff you're doing and, and how, you know, really how we can probably all be better parents for anybody listening to this. And uh, but just kind of give us a backstory of what's made you the man you are today, Adam. What's made me the man I am today? Um, well, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, a big part of who I am is a psychologist and it's just something I've always wanted to do. Um, even when I was a kid, I know it sounds weird, but I was playing psychologist when I was like six years old. Oh, now wow. that may have something to do with the fact that my mom was a psychologist. So I think I was following in her footsteps. But I think that that really, you know, when I work with patients, I really think about trying to help people understand and teenagers to clarify their values and where, they're, where they want to go based upon their values. And so as a psychologist, um, you know, the values of uh, forming relationships is really central central to me as a person, central to me as a, as a therapist, because therapy is really about a relationship. Um, yeah, you know, being of service to people. Um, and there's all sorts of ways to be of service to people. It's not just to be in the helping profession. Sure. Um, but I think that, that you know, I really am who, who I've known and, and friends that I've had along the way. And that's made me into uh, the man I am today. Awesome. Well, beautiful. So let's talk about this pandemic, man, and what, what you've seen and, and what this is doing to, to our kids today. What were your thoughts on that from your professional side, your professional opinion? You know, it's really, it, it's been so challenging to all of us and it, especially to kids and different kids respond to it in different ways. Um, there are, there are kids who have felt a relief being at home. Um, they are, you know, less social, maybe more introverted. They like to stay in their pajamas. So for them, the return to school this fall, depending on where you're and what part of the country, but here this fall, you know, has been a challenge. Other kids, especially teenagers, have been so just, you know, feel like they've been shut down, have been cut down at the knees in terms of, you know, such an important part of their life or the, or the college students I work with, um, you know, because they can't get these years back. Uh, you can't get a prom back. You can't get a sophomore year of college back. You can't get a, a, a term where you're going to be rushing a fraternity back. So, you know, I've seen them really struggle. And, and, and I think that it's for all of us, it's been a struggle of meaning. Um, you know, how do we find meaning at different stages along the way uh, in terms of the pandemic at the beginning when it felt like it was, you know, such a, a, a sense of survival and threat. And now yeah. that we kind of have it in perspective, but it still has changed, you know, our, our life our lifestyle in terms of, uh, you know, goods not being as available, more waiting times, just things that we've always taken for granted. So I think that these kinds of threats uh, or challenges have caused all of us, but especially kids to, you know, to look inward and to decide, as I was talking about values before, what's meaningful, what's important, because, you know, many times you have to reassess. If you're asking. Yes. Yeah. So let's continue to talk about that. You said values now for the second time, which I 100% agree. And it's it's great to hear you say that because you hear it from the business side all the time, right? What are the values of your organization and and this and that? But when you talk about the values of of a child, so are you walking through with your patients or clients as whatever, 16, 14, 12 year olds, uh, on what their actual values are? Well, I ask and I ask this to adults too, because they work with adults and kids, but I ask you know, what do you need to have in your life? What do you want in your life to make it purposeful and meaningful? Um, and, you know, you think that people say the basics, you know, that, you know, good, good family, good relationships, if you're older, good career. And that's true. But, 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 you know, it varies uh, amongst people in many different ways. And so for kids, you have to kind of nail it down a little bit and get down to the, you know, to the nitty gritty. Um, is They say good grades is a good, that's just, this is part of what the book is about. He's not lazy. Um, or the new book that I have coming out actually tomorrow, which is for teens, um, which is, you know, do you want those grades for you? Or do you want them for your parents? Um, because in order for kids to excel, in order for them to do well in school, it has to be for them ultimately. Um, we can talk more about that. We can get into the weeds on that. But 
but ultimately, you know, when I try to help kids, what I try to help parents do is understand that and try to help kids to find that uh, so that so that they can, you know, sludge through a, a math class if they don't think they'll ever use something. Right. They can care less <laughs> about that math class. Right. right so, exactly. so the parents that aren't fortunate enough to have somebody like you in their life, what what would you do, say to us parents at home right around the kitchen table or bedtime? What are some of the processes we can go through with our kids that maybe help them look internally and why those grades are important? Well, a, a lot of what I write about in the book, he's not lazy, uh, empowering your son to believe in himself. And, you know, this book was targeted to parents of boys, but it works, it works for girls as well. Um, but, you know, the idea is that um, uh, we want our kids to have autonomy because when I, when I started to look into the research on motivation and how it applies to teenagers, uh, what I found was the most significant aspect was autonomy, a sense that you have control over your destiny, that you get to choose. Uh, the thing is that I think what many parents forget is that autonomy comes with accountability. The accountability is what happens when you make the right choice, you get the reward or the wrong choice. You know, you have to deal with it, you get the punishment or the challenge, and can you figure that out for your next decision? Uh, so first of all, a lot of parents um, that I see are, are not holding their kids accountable in, in, in certain ways, which is really about doing too much for them. Um, you know, it, it can be about making them, you know, make their bed in the morning and, and bouncing the nickel off of it. Um, but I think it's, I think it's more about um, not over parenting, not helicopter parenting, because parents, even up through when kids have their first job now, feel like it's their responsibility to, to take care of all these loose ends, you know, and to, to allow the kids to be free to bring honor to the family by getting good grades or getting a good job or getting into Harvard or, 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 or wherever, um, wash you. Um, yeah. and I think that, I think that that's, that that's key. Uh, the second though is to give kids the space to be able to make those decisions and, uh, figure out for themselves what they find important and what they don't. Now, I don't mean let kids do whatever they want because, you know, your, your couch would have holes in it, your dog's running around and there'd be no homework done. Um, and the refrigerator would be left open. What I mean is that it's our job to keep our kids on track, but the kids have to be the one driving the train. Uh, and so what I see is that parents get into power struggles constantly and are micromanaging and, you know, did you do your homework? And now it's the online grading, uh, you know, platforms checking and, you know, going in and saying to your kid, you know, do you need anything when they're really checking to see if they're doing their homework? All these things, I think, um, parenting at a, you know, close range really takes the autonomy away from kids. So giving kids the space uh, to, to decide what kind of grades they want, parents give them a reasonable range, it doesn't have to be A's, and then give them a little space to figure out if they can do it, I think is really important. And with the, with the understanding that I have to remind parents of all the time, these kids are growing, you know, they're developing. And we forget that because we put so much pressure on kids to be, you know, uh, junior executives at the age of 17 and to figure things out and to meet all the demands that they have to face that we forget that, that boys mostly just need more time. You know, um, it, it used to be that uh, you know, now we say we, we talk about underachievers uh, where we used to talk about late bloomers, you know, and an underachiever is already behind, but a late bloomer still has time to catch up. Mm. And so when you say that, you know, give them autonomy, I, I, I love that. Um, so let me play devil's advocate on that a little bit. And you said we can't just let them obviously go do whatever they want. So I understand what you're saying. But for that child that may not want to do his homework, if you give them, you know, we always say, hey, we're going to give you a lot of leash, right? And, and so a lot of runway. But, but if they're not doing it, how do we hold them accountable without them feeling like we are being the helicopter parent? By giving them some runway and some leash, not a lot and not too little, just like Goldilocks and the three bears. It has to be just right. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I think that um, it's about sitting down with the kid and saying, you know, what do you expect? What do you think you can do? What help you, do you need to do that? And then stepping back a bit, giving them three weeks, four weeks, maybe not a whole marketing term, seeing how they're doing. And then saying, you know what, 
we think that you probably have too much time on your hand playing video games and you need to spend more time doing your homework. So we're going to reduce the amount of time you have to play video games until your grades go back up. Yeah. So it's still setting limits and it's still uh, following up on what kids are doing. It's just not sitting or breathing over their neck. Because when you breathe over their neck, here's what happens. It becomes, Brett, it becomes your struggle, not their struggle anymore. You know, what I talk about in the book is called uh, the, the, uh, the paradox of ambivalence. Um, kids are ambivalent about doing better in school. They have mixed feelings about it. Um, they want to do better, but they also don't want to do the work or afraid of particularly unmotivated boys are afraid if they apply themselves and they don't succeed. That means they're not really smart. So it's better to say, I didn't do my homework, you know, and, and not have to worry about maybe what they fear is the real reason. When parents step in and they take over the, the, the they care more about the homework than the kids care about, then the ambivalence, if this makes sense, it gets split, the different sides of it, you know, the pro and the con. So I'll just use a quick example. Many couples go through this if they're gonna have kids. The husband says, I'm ready to have kids. Um, and the wife is like, oh, no, no, I'm not ready. I, you know, I need to, I need to, we need to travel. We need to do this. And as long as one is holding on to the, I'm not ready. And the other is holding on to the, I'm ready. Then the couple's okay. But as soon as it switches, I know this happened with my wife. And I, as soon as the, the, the wife's like, you know what? I'm ready to have kids now. The husband's like, oh, wait a minute. Now I'm not. And couples go through this back and forth until they're really ready. So the same thing happens with the parents and kids. Kid says, you know. Uh, I don't have to do well in school. Parents says, yes, you do. And therefore the kid doesn't have to have the conflict inside them. If this makes sense, what they end up doing is just, it becomes the parent's problem. And then they're fighting with the parent, get off my back. If you're the problem, not whether I think I can succeed is the problem. Yeah. So that's why parents have to step back a bit, but, but still set some boundaries and limits. And what, what's your philosophy on, you know, the taking something, you know, if you're not doing your homework, you know, your phone is mine or your, you know, your whatever, right? Whatever it is, that thing, that dangle, that carrot, what is your philosophy on that? Uh, my philosophy on that is in some ways we lost the war against technology and we need to keep fighting and we need to rally troops and develop better weapons because, you know, we, won't, we want to take away the phone, but then the kid is needing to text for homework or we want to take away the computer, but kids can't do their homework without so I think that, uh, you know, there are there are different systems that allow parents to monitor and to shut down certain websites at different times. I don't know how well they work. I haven't found one that is the magic bullet. But I think that absolutely that's one of the things that parents have to monitor. So I think it's very reasonable for, for, for parents to say, you know, you, you, you charge your phone overnight. It's, it's on the counter in the kitchen. You don't need to take it to bed with you. Yeah. And it's also one of the things that parents need to shut down if the kid, you know, after that three week period, if the kid's grades aren't so hot, then, um, then either maybe the kid has to bring the computer downstairs and I'll tell you a story about that. Um, but the kid has to bring the computer downstairs where they can see what's going on on the monitor for a while until the kid is ready to then, you know, have that independence. Um, there was a family I knew that had their son bring the computer downstairs, put it in the dining room so that they would uh, keep track of what he was doing on his computer. And he said that was like a monitor away from him. little parents were like, okay, you know, they met him halfway. And then for some reason they didn't understand there was a glass uh, uh, china cabinet behind him, and he opened the glass doors every time he did his homework. Finally, his dad yeah. realized it was because the kid knew that the reflection of the computer would be in the class when he could the <laughs> video game. So right. this, this, this young kid, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still in touch with him every once in a while. In fact, he called me just the other day and he said, Dad, I need to borrow some money. <laughs> like, yeah, right. <laughs> That's he's, actually, funny. He, he's actually done okay. He made it through graduate school. But That's good. every parent struggles with these things. Yeah. And they're, they're quick, aren't they, man? They, they learn and they understand that stuff that we're not even thinking of the mirror behind them. That's going to reflect the game. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's crazy. So, I mean, I think too, is sometimes your pride or ego, different things. I know for me can be in there is that, you know, you want your kid to do this one thing. And if they don't like, I get mad, right? Like I, I always, well, maybe I'm the only one, I doubt it, but like, how do you control your own anger when you're wanting somebody to do something and you want it more than maybe they want it? Well, I think that's a, that, 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 that is a smart question that, you know, I'm glad you're thinking about and parents need to think about because we really have to be aware of 
our investment, what we're looking for from our kids, because we all want gratification. We all want our kids to be successful for themselves, but also so that we feel good as parents. You know, that's just a part of parenting. But very often when, it, when a kid is not doing what we think they should be doing, it makes us feel like we're not good parents. You know, like if I were a better parent, my kid would be making that bed perfectly or be getting straight A's or whatever, or, or hitting a home run, whatever it is. And I think we have to monitor that because it's okay to want it, but it's right. not okay to put it on the, on the kid. Um, you know, what, what makes us good parents is to be consistent, to be um, supportive, to be, you know, to have their back, but not necessarily to need them to do everything at every given moment. So I think that's really important. Parenting the kid that you have at a particular moment is really important. Recognizing what they're able to do now is not what they're going to be able to do later. It'll be more and greater. Um, so understanding where they are developmentally is really important as well. And then finally, and Brett, I, I, this is like the best advice. If, if, if listeners uh, want one piece of advice to take from this, don't take things your kid does or says too personally. Um, your spouse too, it'll help your marriage. But I think also, you know, because so many times we take, we end up taking it personally and, you know, kids don't mean it personally, even when they're young and they tell us they hate us or we're mean, they're just saying they're angry. You know, I'm not saying that you have to tolerate, you shouldn't tolerate kids swearing at you, but, but it's not personal. It's just them expressing yeah. their anger and the only way that they can do at that age. And I think that's the pride and ego part, right? That's what I'm talking about is, and maybe that's a male thing. I'm sure maybe moms deal with it too, but it is sometimes if a kid talks back, you know, I got four kids. And so I always joke there and say, what's the, what's the toughest thing about four kids? I'm like juggling the plates and personalities of wanting right. to make sure everybody's happy. Right. But everybody's in different moods as human beings all the time. And so I think that's the tough part though, that I know I do personally, because I'm an only child and now raising four boys, it, you know, my house was quiet. And if you wanted that ball over there, you just went and got the ball. Right. And now well, like nobody wants the ball until somebody wants the ball. And then it's, you know, all hell can break loose with four boys, which is great and fine uh, sometimes, but it sometimes can get, get be a little bit much too. So I think it's tough though. I think it's really tough to sometimes not take it personal. It is tough. It is tough. And sometimes you're gonna, um, but I think it's important to check that, to be aware of it, because that's really when you end up making bad decisions as, as a parent, you know, when yeah when you take things personally, when you feel guilty about something with the kid or when you um, care more about them than they, more about, not about them, about what, what they're doing, what they're producing than they care themselves. Yeah. So let's talk about EQ versus IQ. I mean, when, when you hear those things, does one stand out more than others that you as a, as a parent or you as a psychologist would like to really focus on more? Um, well, that's an interesting point because I mean, obviously, I deal more with EQ than with IQ. Not that IQ, you know, intelligence is fixed. Um, people can get smarter. That's a whole other chapter in the book. Um, but about self-efficacy. But, but what parents don't seem to understand a lot, and, and I get it, is that they, you know, maybe the kid's been tested. Maybe they know the kid's smart. And so they don't understand why my son is not achieving his potential. You know, and I say it like that because, it, you know, because I hate hearing that. Um, whenever I give talks, um, uh, which unfortunately COVID has shut down, yeah, no but, um, when I was, had the, 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 you know, the good fortune of traveling around and talking to parents around the country, I would always say, you know, uh, who here, you know, raise your hand if you achieved your potential in fourth grade, um, mm -hmm. and no one would raise their hand. And then I'd say, who's, who's achieved their potential now? Who's achieved right. their potential today? Only one parent said that they achieved their potential. I told them they didn't have to stay for the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You actually haven't out. achieved your potential because you're so unaware, right? But anyway. So, so yeah. So getting back to your, to, your, to your question, I think what parents don't appreciate, and this is about the point I was making earlier or need to appreciate about, about where kids are developmentally, is just because your kid's smart, just because they have a, a, a above average IQ, doesn't mean that they have the emotional wherewithal at that particular moment in time as a 15 year old, as a 16 year old, even as a, as a 10 year old, to be able to accomplish everything in front of them. They don't have the, the executive skills, the organizational skills, the planning, the foresight. It's just not in their brain yet. It hasn't developed yet. So, so grades and intelligence don't always go together. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot more there. Uh, you know, you can call it maturity. 
um, if you want, Brett. But you know, there's all sorts of maturity. Some one, you know, you have teenagers. One minute they seem more mature than you could ever imagine, and the next minute they're pulling your younger brother's hair because they want that ball. So right, that's funny. So what? Um, and, and I guess off the professional side as well. So not just everything on parenting, but are, are you seeing people? You said kind of IQ, yeah, you can grow that a little bit, but EQ, what, what do you see or what do you recommend for the focus to grow the emotional intelligence for people? Well, I, you know, that's, it's a big, big topic because emotional intelligence involves, you know, reading people, uh, reading cues, empathy, um, self-awareness, you know. So, so I think that, that helping kids to manage their feelings on a day-to-day basis um, is really important. That's a good place to start. Self-awareness, being able to, uh, you know, feelings tell us something. Um, your sadness tells us that it's time to slow down and, and figure out what's bothering us. Anger means that our rights have been have been, in, you know, uh, stepped on, and we have to figure out what how so we don't make it happen again. So, so kids need to be emotional detectives, and parents can really help them to slow down and understand how they're feeling just by asking. You know, parents often jump to a solution. Um, why don't you do this? Or rather than saying, well, how do you feel about that? Or why do you feel that way? And so I think that that's a really good place to start because more, the more kids from a young age are aware of their feelings and able to articulate them, um, the better they are going to be at empathy and understanding other people's feelings as well as at responding. Um, you know, having kids in social, some kids need more coaching in social situations. Some kids need to be encouraged to be in social situations. Uh, other kids, just like other adults, they, you know, they get it right away and they, they understand they can read the room. Um, so it's really knowing your kid, I think is awesome. Yeah. So I, you know, I've been in wealth management for over 20 years now. And, and so we, you know, there's always that one or two questions that you get asked. That you kind of like, Oh, you know, you're at a kid's game or something and somebody will ask you something, but what's that thing as a psychologist that you see from either a parenting thing or just being a professional or a human being just in general, what's kind of that one question that you're like, Oh man, when I see that, or I see a parent do that. Like, oh, that, that like just strikes a nerve for you. Well, I, I'll tell you, you know, obviously, you know, mistreating a kid, you know, or yelling at a kid in a supermarket, although at, at, we have all yelled at kids in supermarkets, you know, <laughs> so it's not necessarily fair to judge, um, uh, to judge that. But I, I think that the simplest thing is just, just to remember to ask. So when I see, you know, when parents jump in too quickly, um, you know, here, here's just a little, uh, a little, you know, kind of simple example, but your kid comes to you and he says, your son comes to you and he says, you know, I want to quit the, I want to quit the baseball team. I don't want to play anymore. Um, and you say, well, you can't quit. You have to play, you know, you made a commitment to the team and you can't let them down and, and you got it, you got to stick it out. And the kid walks away thinking, okay, I'll stick it out, but I'm not going to try. So another scenario, and listen, these scenarios go well because I make them up. But another scenario is, um, you know, the kid says, I want to quit the baseball team. And, and the parent says, why? Tell me about it. Which is, to me, the place you start. And many parents are worried that if they ask that question, it's going to give the kid the, uh, the validation, you know, the reason to uh, quit. Um, empathy, understanding how someone feels, does not mean you agree with them. It means you just understand. So why do you want to quit? Um, well, you know, the, the coach hasn't been playing me. I've been sitting on the bench for the last week. Okay, well, then let's talk about that and see, you know, why that is. Maybe you should talk to the coach. Maybe, you know, there's things we can do to figure that out. Why don't we try to do that first before you just quit? Um, and then, you you know, then you come up with a solution. So I think it's very simple, but I think that uh, it's so easy to forget. And, and not only because we may be anxious, as you said, or taking something personally or have our own feelings, but also because we want to solve the problem. We want to jump in and solve right. the problem. And that's not necessarily what kids are asking. for. Yeah. I think you're so right on that too, is that, you know, we ask questions all the time in our work related lives and it's, you know, we got to ask the same questions to our kids. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you're not, you know, it's not rocket science here other than it's, it's difficult. I believe. I think it's, it's very difficult. I always say it's parenting is the greatest job in the world, hands down. Uh, but it's also one of the most difficult jobs in the world. Well, I think it is the most difficult because, as you alluded to before, uh, astutely, uh, our feelings are there. We have our feelings involved. We're not we're not objective. We can't step back and and give advice or or, or think through a problem. We've got we've got it's very subjective. 
But let me ask you, you know, you, you have this wonderful podcast where you talk to people about success every week. Um, are there are there any elements that I've talked about in parenting that you would generalize to success for adults in the workplace, like EQ or empathy? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the one you just said is ask questions, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I always tell people ADT, ask, don't tell. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and so if you come to me and, and say, to your point, if I want to quit the baseball team, the kind of that aha moment for me was, you know, asking questions. Because if that child walks themselves through that, and then they end up deciding they want to play on the baseball team. That's a much more powerful thing than you saying, nope, you know, you're, you're going to play on the baseball team. Uh, you made a commitment. Uh, you know, that's it. Right. Like you said, now the kid, so same thing, right. If somebody comes into my office from a work thing and they ask a question, I could tell them maybe the answer, but I've learned from great leaders and, and being in, in the business for so long now is if I can ask a question, and let you come up with the answer, it's the gospel. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You'll run through a brick wall for that decision. Mm-hmm. But it's not me giving you that decision. So I would say that's number one. I think number two is, uh, I call it the bounce back theory, is when you are given some rejection, right? Some difficult stuff in your life, how fast can you bounce back? Mm-hmm. And I think to your point in, in business, there's, I mean, there's certainly there's feelings, right? We love what we do. It's our career. It's how we provide for our families. There's feelings there, but it is a different feeling than the feeling you have as a spouse or a parent, right? There can be more emotions in that. And I think the more we can focus on that, those emotions, you know, at home and work, um, there is integration there. And, and people want to have this balance. And I don't believe there really is a balance because if you have a bad morning at home, you're probably going to have a bad start to the day, right? Or if you have a bad work day, you may bring it home, right? So then how do we divide those things uh, is what I find that really, really good leaders and, and successful people to answer your question do at the highest level possible. And to, and to yeah, and, you know, to your point, because one of the chapters and he's not lazy is about masculinity and about, um, how boys are taught not to have their feelings and, you know, you know, shake it off, grow up hair, big boys don't cry. And along with that though, is, is also being taught not to ask for help. Yeah. Um, and you know, what you just said is you have to, to just having access to your feelings uh, doesn't mean that you're wearing them on your sleeve and that you're crying all day. It just means that you know how you're feeling so you can right. deal with it um, and know when to deal with it and how to put it aside. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it makes me think, how do we as coaches, right? So I coach a lot of different sports throughout the year. And you, you know, I always got that kid on the team that cries after a strikeout or something. I'm like, what, what's the proper way to help that? You know, I always try to console them and tell them it's okay. We all strike out, you know, and, and it just never seems to work. Right? And I know there's not much I can do on the, you know, the two hours I have them, you know, for a couple of times a week. But what are your thoughts on that? Because they're crying every time, you mean? Yeah. I mean, a kid cries when they strike out and it's kind of like, you know, it's okay. It's okay. We all strike out. Um, yeah, I think it takes a little, I mean, I think that's a kid who probably is putting too much pressure on themselves yeah. or, or, and you know, there's nothing scarier than standing in front of a plate, staring at a picture with everybody watching. Right. Um, right. It, it, other than being the pitcher, it, it is a little anxiety provoking, but I think, I think, I think don't underestimate the fact that every time you reassure that kid, even though they cry the next time, they're not hearing you and they won't take that message with them because they will yeah. um, because kids do take important, you know, thoughtful messages with them. Um, and I think it's probably a kid who's feeling too much pressure from within or parent. You need to sit them down and have just a little bit more of a conversation, but maybe, maybe that's how they bat at that age. Maybe they bat, they hit they, or they strike out and they cry. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Would, would you say there's any big parenting advice? Like if you said there's the, you know, this one, two or three things that you kind of, you know, when I say preach in, in a, in a way, is, is there those things that are out there that, you know, we need to be doing like day in, day out as a parent? Well, I think, I mean, I hopefully I've covered them in terms of uh, giving sure. kids autonomy, but holding them accountable, um, not getting into power struggles, not helicopter parenting. Um, and not taking things too personally. I mean, I think that those are, and you know, communicating. Yeah. You know, if, you're, if you have a spouse, communicating with your spouse is really important about the kid. Um, open communications, uh, you know, in the family is really important. So I think those are all the things I would hit on. But you know, I, I, I want to also 
to touch on something else because I have a new book actually that's coming out tomorrow, um, as I mentioned, and it's it's called uh, the He's Not Crazy. He's not crazy. He's not lazy. <laughs> he may be crazy, but he's not lazy. <laughs> it's a, I should have said gravy. Um, <laughs> the He's Not Crazy. He's Not Lazy Guide to uh, Better Grades and a Great Life. And it's a book for teenagers. It's a workbook, and there's parent involvement also. Um, there's a lot of activities, um, but that that teens can do to help them to kind of not only to to learn how to set goals and learn how to uh, uh, time management, but also values clarification. What are the values? What you know? What do they want to do? But 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 I came up with something for the book that that is an equation that I think is an equation for success, and the equation is accountability plus capability equals pride. Wow. So my, accountability versus capability. Plus capability. Or, yeah. Plus, sorry. Yeah. Equals pride. And you know, my first, but my first equation was accountability plus capability equals success. But I changed it to pride because what we really want our kids to do is to be proud of what they do. We want them to be proud. We, we need to tell them that we're proud of them. But we want them to take actions and to and to accomplish things that they feel proud of. And, and again, they get to define what what that is for them. For some kids, it may be more about how they treat their friends. For other kids, it may be the performance on, you know, on the soccer pitch. And for some, it may be grades um, or, or, or a solo in an orchestra, whatever it is, you know, but what they master. So in order to have pride in what you do, you have to have capability. You have to be able to learn how to do things. Right. That's what childhood is all about. You know, we forget that, um, you know, kids, we, we, we want to rush kids through the process of childhood um, and not really give them the time to fail or to or to make mistakes, even though we say we, we're going to do that. You know, oh, we can't let them fail as, as a freshman and not do well because that'll affect what college they get into. That's when they need to do it. You know, that's when they need the time to do it. So in order for kids to develop capability, they have to be able to take risks. Right. They have to be able to step out of their, and there's a whole section in this book on that. They have to be able to step, step out of their comfort zone um, in order to try new things, in order to feel comfortable. As adults, you know, when was the last time you learned to do something new that you've never done before? Maybe you ski or play golf. I don't know, but you've been you've been doing that, you know, and you always want to get, I ski, but I always want to get better at skiing, but I've been doing it since I was a kid. You know, I haven't, I haven't picked up anything new. Kids are picking things up new all the time, and it's really a wonderful wonderful thing, but it's also scary. So supporting them and taking risks, encouraging them, encouraging them, making it okay to make mistakes, that it's really about learning is really important. And then the other part of the equation is what we've already talked about, accountability. Um, and, and we want, ultimately, we want kids to hold themselves accountable. That's really what we're going for. Yep. I love that. Accountability plus capability equals pride. We want our kids to feel proud of what they do. Yeah, I mean, gosh, absolutely. So tell us about the book. Why, why is it called He's Not Lazy? Well, <laughs> it's called He's Not Lazy because my publisher wanted to brand me. That's why <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to call it School Sucks, but you still have to go. Um, oh, because I, I thought that. that would be more appealing to teenagers. So um, yeah. so we came up with this title because it's really not about better grades. Um, it is about having a, a great life. And, and for kids, you know, the message is, you, again, you get to define that. You get to figure out what your goals are. Um, and, but 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 don't forget that kids have already internalized the goals that we've been teaching them. So the kid that says, I don't care about school, I don't want to do well in school, of course they want to do well in school. Um, they may not admit it to you, but 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 there's a rare kid who really doesn't want to do well in school. They may think they can't, they may put this on right. as kind of a as kind of a defensive, you know, veneer, kind of a I'm I'm tough, I'm strong, but they really do want to, they do want to please us, they do want to make us proud. Um, and so a lot of their values are our values because we've been, you know, we've been bringing them up with them. So you get the book and then the workbook comes out or the guide, I should say, comes out tomorrow. Right. So yeah. where do we find those? Um, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, hopefully your local bookseller. Um, yeah. Awesome. And where do our listeners find more uh, of Dr. Adam Price? If they want to learn more about you. Um, I've got a, well, I've got a website. He's not lazy. Uh, and then I've got a website, uh, which is just dradamprice.com. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes, Adam. This has been phenomenal. I've gotten tons of takeaways here. It's always good podcast when you got, you know, a page and a half of notes. It always feels good. So, uh, well, I appreciate your time. I know you got a lot cooking and it's awesome to have you And And we'll send people to get that book because like I said, I've been listening to, he's not lazy on audible 
Uh, and it's a, it's a great book, tons of takeaways. I'm going to get the guide tomorrow. And that guide, it sounds like uh, my, my son, my kids will be doing more of that or will I be doing it as well? Well, the hope is that your kids will be doing it. There's some exercises for you to do with them. Um, yeah. And, and to kind of help them along, but yeah, yeah, it's, mo it's mostly for them. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time today. Hey, Alan. thank really you. Appreciate it. Good talking to you. Bye -bye. Good talking to you.